I'm Nick. I'm from uh, Imperial War Museums. I won't lie, a bit of a change of pace from the guide dogs and Animal Crossing. <laughs> um, uh, uh, thank you, Vim. It was actually th late Thursday was you Thursday? told me I had to speak at this event, so a bit of a rush. Uh, um, but uh, always a pleasure, actually. This is always a really good uh, event, so really happy to be here. I, um, I actually come from uh, the charity sector. I used to be the head of digital for guide dogs, so uh, lots of familiar stuff going on there. Um, I actually think, following on from that presentation, I think one of the really inter interesting takeaways for me is how important the testing and learning is. Often going into this world is really new for us, so you shouldn't expect to somehow, a lot of these events you see presentations, it looks like first try and that, you know, it was a hole in one. And, uh, and actually the reality is it involves a lot of testing and learning and, and building up kind of uh, a, a really good base of kind of intelligence into what has worked and what hasn't worked. So I thought that was a really fantastic um, takeaway from the guide dog stuff. And, and that's how we would be approaching this as well. Some things that we've tried have worked, others uh, less so. And, you know, so we'll, we'll, we'll always keep looking at that. The other thing is that we're largely going to talk about are raising awareness so so not primarily fundraising and i think that's also a key aspect here because if if people don't know you're a charity they won't give you money which um probably takes me to my first point which i don't know is actually a charity and a lot of people don't know that it's one of our first biggest hurdles is um getting people to understand that we do receive some government funding it doesn't go anywhere near covering operating costs so we do have to raise money um so uh that's that um but we also have uh, a mission. So a lot of people think uh, we're a military museum and, and um, military museums, how I would sort of describe them are museums where they're sort of preserving our military heritage. Still important that we, that we do that. But that's not what IWM is. IWM is actually about explaining conflict. And our mission is to communicate a better understanding of the causes, course and consequences of war. And there are any number of ways in which we do that. Now, as a museum, we have a, a, a huge collection. So we have 155,000 uh, objects, uh, exhibits. Um, we've got 23,000 hours of film. We've got uh, 33,000 hours of sound archive. And all of this is growing all the time because we cover conflicts up till the present day. So the <laughs> MOD are constantly like dropping off stuff at IWM for us to preserve. And we're digitizing a lot of this stuff as well. Uh, we have other, all, all kinds of other documents uh, that, you know, that we can use, that people can use for research. You can come and do your own research at IWM. You can access research online. Um, we, we're, we've got a growing collection online as well. We've got 11 million photographs. Uh, 11 million sounds like a lot. I checked my Google Photos the other day. I'm approaching that myself, actually. Um, so about 11 million. We're, we're trying to digitize and describe 11 million photographs. So it's a huge job. We've done approximately a million so far. We've got plans to do another 1.7 million. But digitizing this archive is, is a huge job. It's really expensive, uh, but, but worth doing. Um, so so how, do we, how do we raise that awareness amongst our audience today? Well, we've got um, uh, five branches. So everyone, a lot of people we talk to, they know about Imperial War, War Museum London. If you live in London or the South, you'll have been dragged there, around there against your will as a child. That's what we used to do to children. <laughs> um, and, uh, but we actually have four more branches. Um, this is one of them. This is the HMS Belfast. That's also part of Imperial War Museums. It's the only branch of ours that can sink. So we're always very nervous about that. Uh, um, we also have... <coughs> it's the only one that floats. Well, that we've tested. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we won't test the others. Um, we've got uh, Churchill War Rooms. It used to be the Cabinet War Rooms in Westminster. Uh, IWM Duxford, which is a working airfield. Uh, and IWM North, um, which is in Salford Keys, uh, not Manchester. They always tell us not. Salford is its own city, and you have to say that. <laughs> um, so, uh, so through our branches, and the great thing about our branches, you know, this this is a part of our collection as well as being a branch. You can you can touch it. You can like feel the history, and it's a really great way of. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. That's all right. Don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, um, so, uh, yeah, you can touch history. A lot, a lot of our objects you can touch, which is great. Some of you can't. But um, uh, you can touch these objects. And that's a great way, along with the interpretation, that's a great way of understanding conflict. Um, but we also have um, yeah, gr a growing digital presence. So this is our YouTube channel. We've grown it from 8,000 subscribers to 362,000 this year uh, in that 
I think we're on 8,000 at the beginning of 2020. So, so huge growth of our YouTube channel and the, how we changed our YouTube channel as we started to try to understand the questions that people had about conflict and build out <laughs> stories that, that led to the answers to those questions, hopefully. Um, we also have a, a website we've grown from 8 million visitors to I think it's going to be 18 million visitors this year. Again, we're telling in-depth story. So here in the museum, especially if you've got kids like me, you get to read about three words of any panel before you have to move on to the next thing. So there's a fantastic opportunity to then go to the website afterwards and explore more and discover more. We have a, a podcast called Conflict of Interest uh, that's had sort of, I think it's getting on 50,000 uh, listens so far. That's really good. But also we publish books uh, about conflict um, uh, that you can buy in our shops and online. Another thing that we do, here's a, this is the poster for Dunkirk. Um, so we consult on, we've been doing this for quite a while now, we consult on a lot of um, war movies, movies about conflict. Uh, we've done that for a long time now, and actually any, any big movie that comes out, 2017, uh, Dunkirk, for example, movies like Fury, uh, you know, the, we've been, we, we're, we're often really involved in, uh, in the con consultancy for that, uh, but also providing sort of detail that they wouldn't otherwise be able to access uh, through our collection and through people like Ian, who you'll meet shortly. <laughs> uh, um, so, so that's the context of what we've done so far. But of course, in the meantime, uh, a huge amount of, oh, uh, this is the other thing I forgot to mention. So this is They Shall Not Grow Old. So this is a, a Peter Jackson film. Actually, it's a Peter Jackson IWM co-production in reality. Uh, <laughs> uh, often isn't presented that way, so that's why we're keen to point it out. So all of this is our, uh, our footage uh, that, that we digitized. Peter Jackson did a, a whole lot of really fascinating and interesting work in changing the speed of this film uh, and uh, colorizing it. And you'll see, we actually were involved in quite a lot of the colorization as well. Um, and it really takes, when you used to see this film footage, it, um, everyone used to walk at a funny pace, right? It's because all of the film is hand cranked. And so, because they're cranking the film by hand, it's always at a random frame rate. So all of this, all of the frame rates here have been uh, corrected and, and interpolated. So often they'll be 12 or 15 frames a second, then now up to 24 frames a second when you're watching these films. So, and then what used to look faintly ridiculous in World War I archive then becomes much more meaningful. Um, so I'll probably, th this is a fact, if you haven't seen, who's, who's, put, who's seen They Shall Not Grow Old? All right, everyone else has to go and seek this out, all right? We put a lot of work into this. Don't waste our efforts. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, it's fantastic. I don't know if it's still on iPlayer. Is it still on iPlayer or is it gone? Might still be on BBC iPlayer. Okay. So huge amounts of work that we've put into um, our work with the film industry. Now, this, has been, this was covered before, but actually if you're going to access something like the film industry or the video games industry, yeah, we could make a film, right? Or you could make a video game. But actually, the, the important thing is the access right, to that community. And that's what's been covered quite a lot before. So when we were talking about gamers before, uh, just, just to point out, by the way, I think gamers is okay. I think a lot of gamers are happy to be described as gamers. Uh, they self-identify as gamers. Um, so I think that's fine. Some won't be, and that's fine as well. I think the key point around gamers is that actually there are so many of them that it's important to understand which gamers you're trying to access. So. Uh, video game market is currently 178 billion globally, worth 6 billion in the UK, projected to be worth 268 uh, billion globally by 2025. There are 44.54 million gamers in the UK. That, uh, that's up from 36 million during the pandemic. I don't know whether it's gone down again. <laughs> um, it might have. Um, um, I said, it says only 90%. 90% is quite high. 90% play for more than one hour per week. Uh, the most popular war game is still Call of Duty. Um, 250 million people played at least one Call of Duty game in 2020. Again, suspect it's gone down now. People are working a bit more. But, but um, 250 million people is a, a lot of people. Uh, over a million Google searches per month for Call of Duty. And Call of Duty Warzone has over 100 million monthly active players. Fortnite has 83 million monthly active players players. So we're talking about huge numbers here. And the interesting thing for us as an organization that wants to help people better understand conflict is we, there are huge amounts of people here already absorbed in conflict. Now, fine, it's a game, 
Okay. So one of the key things we're trying to do is to figure out how we access those people. And there are a number of routes to doing that. And we think probably, given that these war games are already quite successful, I don't think IWM are going to be able to create some sort of Call of Duty competitor. Uh, my understanding is that would be quite pricey. Um, so, so, so we probably won't be doing that. Um, yes, yeah, Ian's quite keen still. Uh, um, uh, so actually, our, our our kind of first steps into this are through partnerships. One of them is with a company called uh, Rebellion, who make uh, a game called Sniper Elite. The latest one is Sniper Elite 5, where they've actually come to the museum and digitized a lot of our objects for use in the game. Uh, and also War Games, uh, which is an exhibition that's currently running, that it's free of charge, so you should definitely visit. And it's only down the road. Uh, so let's go now. Shall we go now? <laughs> uh, OK. Uh, um, that's open until um, uh, 28th of May. Uh, so, so hurry up and go and see that. Um, we also create an event called War Games uh, Live uh, and also a Games Jam. So, so that we've got a lot going on. These are our first steps. And part of this is really just try to, trying to figure out the community, trying to understand it and figure out our next steps. But really, we think this is a huge opportunity for Imperial War Museums. I think, probably, oh, this is some, some Sniper Elite stuff. Are there any heads blowing up in this one? We'll I'm going <laughs> to move on just in case there are. Uh, uh, um, good. And introduce Ian Kikuchi. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. uh, hello, everyone. Gosh, there's more of you than I, I haven't actually looked back way, this way. Uh, so, hello, hello, everyone. Yes, I am Ian Kikuchi. I'm curator at Imperial War Museums. Uh, War Games is an exhibition which I curated and is currently open, so do please go and see it. Um, a little bit of background first. Uh, as Nick said, the IWM is Britain's National Museum of War and Conflict. Our mission is to further the public understanding of, of our subject matter. We've been, we've been around since 1917. We opened in 1920. We've been at our current home on Lambeth Road since 1936. Uh, in addition to permanent exhibitions like our recently opened, or la recently, last couple of years, New Second World War and Holocaust galleries, we also do a, a programme of temporary exhibitions, usually on thematic subjects, usually self-contained things. And it was in 2016 that I was working on an exhibition about war films and cinema. And you know, it was a lovely show. We had, we had props and costumes and concept art and posters and Oscars and, and all sorts of things from war films from the First World War to the, the present day. Actually, the opening it opened on the... Actually, no, I thought, I thought there was a tie-in with, with They Shall Not Grow Old, but in fact, there wasn't. Um, but anyhow, so that was 2016. And for my part, I've been a, a curator at IWM since 2007. So what's that, 15 years, 16 years almost. Uh, previously a shop assistant at HMS Belfast. Uh, but I've been a, a gamer, happy to self-identify, a gamer. I've somebody who plays games um, since I was about five years old, when my, when my older brother got, an, got a Nintendo for Christmas. And so I never looked back, really. Uh, it was lovely to see Animal Crossing a second ago. Uh, the best 800 hours of a pandemic me and my wife ever spent. <laughs> uh, so, you know, per ter terrific, really. I, I think Nintendo couldn't have arranged that pandemic better, really, could they? <laughs> you know, perfect timing for their marketing. Um, so... I was working on this war film exhibition about war films, and it seemed to me that, that video games are another huge way in which popular culture engages with war and conflict. And I, I had an idea for an exhibition, and I posed it. My, my original structure was uh, three sections. One called Hardware, so the technical history of computing and video games, going back to Alan Turing and the, the Enigma machine and Colossus. And, and you know, Alan Turing writes a, a chess computer game, which never runs on a computer because he dies before the computers have caught up with his chess algorithm. Um, one, of the, one of the grandfathers of computer games is a guy who was working on the Manhattan Project to build the first atom bomb. He's a witness to the first atomic explosion at Trinity, New Mexico in July 45. Um, and all the way through up to the present day, uh, Sega's arcade machines in the 1990s were powered by a chip developed by, Lockheed, by Martin Marietta for US military simulations. Um, all kinds of ways in which the hardware entangle with, with military history and with development and in defense technology. So that'd be hardware, one section. A second section, software. The, which would look at the ways that games tell stories and what stories they tell. So what stories get told, what stories don't get told. If, you, if all you knew about the Second World War came from video games, what would you think the Second World War was about? You'd probably think it was about Americans fighting Germans, um, probably, probably male Americans, white male Americans, fighting white male Germans for particular... Actually, who knows why, but there'd be a lot of beaches involved, endless, <laughs> endless beaches. Um, so software was that, so hardware and software, and then finally warfare how gaming and simulation and game-related technology gets used to recruit people to armed forces, to train people in the armed forces, to operate military equipment and machinery, how it gets used to entertain soldiers off duty, how, it, how they get used to put people back together again when they've experienced 
events or experiences which lead to conflict-induced PTSD. So the relationship between what military between gaming and simulation and the modern military. Uh, what's my next slide? I might just stand over here, actually, if that's all right, so I can just see what's coming next. Um, so what follows are a series of photographs from the exhibition as it currently stands. It's now open, as I say, down, in, down at IWM London. Uh, over the course of the development, we started in earnest in 2019. Something intervened in 2020 and put things back a year, but we opened uh, last September. And this, this, the subject, the kind of, the emphasis shifted a little bit. So having previously hoped to do my gigantic, sprawling, encyclopedic history of everything that was ever to do with games and war, uh, we've tended, to, we've now focused more, much more tightly on the stories that war games tell and how they tell them. Uh, so this is our, our introductory space. This kind of lexicon of gamey terms appears when, when you're moving between, between spaces. And our, our first space, uh, which we're calling level one. Um, so it's a, a, nine, a nine level show. No final boss, sadly, but, um, <laughs> but the, first, the first space introduces the way that we've told war story, stories throughout different periods. So uh, projected on this screen, we've got, war, we've got uh, Hollywood films, we've got archive film, we've got TV, we've got comic books, we've got fine art, interspersed with uh, clips from the games that feature in our exhibition. Uh, second room is about playing with war more generally, so we have board games in this space, uh, introducing the idea of uh, game design as a, as a kind of particular challenge. Uh, the, and also the idea that game, that playing is a, 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 an instinctive human activity. You know, we're driven to play. And we're driven to play even in extreme situations. So the things you can see here are chess pieces carved by a British officer who was in Japanese captivity during the Second World War. So play, in that case, making those chess pieces gave him something to do with his hands, gave him some creative outlet, and then playing the game provided the social activity and some mental stimulation. And so playing is a really fundamental human activity. Uh, in our third room, we have our talking heads. Normally, when we use talking heads, we, we film them beautifully in a studio. Can't do that when you can't go anywhere. Uh, so we filmed people remotely with webcams and green screens, and quality varied a little bit. So we thought we'll, we'll hide them behind this Game Boy green, four green filter. And so this is Jamie Madigan talking about uh, what makes us want to play video games. So this space has three broad questions, which our academics and advisors kind of discourse on. And most of the rest of the show is a series of case studies. So individual games, uh, looking at the stories they tell and how they tell them. Uh, we open, as it happens, we call the Duty Modern Warfare from 2019. Um, and I should say that putting this show together, IWM doesn't own the IP to these games. So there was a great deal of me knocking, essentially knocking on doors by email saying, hello, I'm doing this exhibition. Can I, can I exhibit your, your stuff? And to my considerable surprise, a great number of people actually said yes, by all means. Um, some with more caveats than others. Uh, some turned us down flat. Um, but Activision said yes, and so we got to talk to their, their audio director and also one of their uh, art directors about how Call of Duty uses sound vision, sound and vision and level design to tell their story of, of fictional modern combat. Uh, back on the other side of that space, this is level four, as you can see, uh, a piece about Armour 3, talking about player agency uh, and multiplayer. So things that th this room is kind of about what makes games games. So art design, sound design, interactivity, agency, and multiplayer, things that other art forms don't have in quite the same way. This room also has a nine channel surround sound experience which plays between this uh, audio, audio visual presentation, playing with the idea that uh, sound is another one of those big tools that, that games use to, to build their worlds. Uh, room five is about shooters, uh, featuring some red barrels. Some of you who know, some of you will know what happens to red barrels in games. Uh, so this game, this space features two games, uh, Sniper Elite 5 and uh, Wolfenstein 3D. It was a great excitement for me to be able to speak to John Romero, the creator of Doom and Quake and a number of other uh, very seminal games. I was totally starstruck. It was very embarrassing. Um, in the same space, we've got, uh, we've got a sniper rifle from our collection. Uh, and beyond that, a kind of Minecrafty pixelated uh, rifle toy, which is part of a, an interactive. Um, actually, just on this wall here, you can't really see it, is a, a blow-up blow illustration from an Austrian newspaper in 1914 showing patrons at an interactive shooting gallery. So even before the First World War, you could go along to... Um, you know, an interactive shooting gallery and shoot guns at screens uh, showing military manoeuvres or safaris or all that kind of thing. So there's something deep in our psychology which has found interactive shooting entertainment fun for more than 100 years. And that's a, so the, the idea of the roots of the first person shooter being before the First World War is kind of incredible. Uh, <laughs> our interactive push the button, pull the trigger uh, thing is nothing more than that. So some cartoon characters cross the, cross the crosshairs there's a soldier, the Second World War kind of Germanish looking soldier, there's a sort of modern looking soldier, there's various civilians, there's, a, there's an Alsatian, and there's a poodle, and there's a robot, and there's a zombie, there's various there's a zombie, and uh, when nobody's watching, people hit the button all the time and shoot everyone. 
uh, when people think they're watching, they always hold back on the, on the cute dog. But the, the Alsatian draws sort of mixed feelings. I'm sorry, guide dogs. It's totally, we love dogs. Dogs are great. Um, no dogs were harmed. No dogs were harmed in the making of this, in the making of this exhibition. Uh, so moving on, spaces six, seven, and eight. Uh, this is kind of an expo space. An expo space. We went to various expos during the course of the, ex the exhibition development, or before COVID, anyway, um, to kind of get ideas, and that kind of ins informed some of the design using using scaffolding poles, also more sustainable, rather than build everything out of MDF and then burn it or bin it after we finished. So six games in this space on three themes. Uh, one one pair is through the darkest of times, which is a strategy game set in the Third Reich before the outbreak of the Second World War. Uh, a game again set, so set in a real historical period. You can't change the outcome, but you can, if you if you if you do well, you can make various acts of resistance against against the Nazis. Uh, also in that space, a game called Six Days in Fallujah, a, a shooter set in the Iraq War in two thousand and four. Uh, in this space, space seven, uh, two games. One called This War of Mine by a Polish company called Eleven Bits Eleven Bit Studios. Uh, a really very influential game about uh, about civilians trying to survive in a war zone, kind of inspired by the siege of Sarajevo in the 90s. A very bleak game, a game that I've spent quite a lot of hours with, but I've never really been able to get on top of, and I struggle to say I ever really had a great deal of fun playing it, but I feel like I learned something from it. And the game, actually, you can see on this particular uh, backdrop is a game called uh, Bury Me My Love, so a, a mobile phone game about the experience of a Syrian refugee. Uh, so you're, you play the husband as your wife tries to make the journey from Damascus to Europe, and the game can end any one of 30 different ways. Uh, the entire game plays out with you replying to her messages with predetermined pre you know, responses, and you can subtly influence the choices she makes, what, the, what route she takes, what decisions she makes, but you never have any control, and so it plays with that. Most games are about agency and empowerment, whereas this game takes that away from you. So it's, you know, my playthrough of that game ended with my wife character dying, after a river, dying of hypothermia after a river crossing. And I kind of sat with that ending and thought, shall I start it again and have another go and try and play the game better? But I thought, actually, no, I'll sit, I'll sit with that ending and own that ending because this is what the game wanted to tell me. So, you know, that's, that's where I'm, I'm not going to go back to the game. I'm going to leave it there. Um, a close up of uh, this is the, this Warmind space. So for each of our games, we've got, a, got interviews with developers, got gameplay footage playing. And we've got objects from our collections which riff off some of the themes. So uh, one of the themes in this war of mine is, is barter and trade. And these are objects um, to do with, that hit a similar theme. So the, the still was used to make uh, alcohol in a German prisoner war camp. Um, the, the teapot was made out of dried milk tins by an internee in Vichy, France. And the objects in the front were, um, belonged to a, were made by a, a man who was interned by the Japanese in, in Java, in Indonesia. Uh, finally, room nine. So this is kind of picking up the, the, hard, uh, the warfare story from my original idea. So how games get used in, in, by the modern military. This is on the screen as a, uh, a, a clip from Virtual Battle Space 4, which is a military training simulation package. And it, and it intercuts with footage from Battlezone 1980, the Atari, the Atari arcade game, uh, just to show how a game that... Uh, so Battlezone, released in 1980, was kind of eyed up as a, as a prototype gunnery trainer by the US Army didn't really come off, but that technology is essentially now manifest in, in full 3D with all the bells and whistles, teaching tank gunners and, in fact, all, all sorts of soldiers, different, all sorts of different things. Uh, in the case, we have an Xbox 360 controller uh, used to operate drones over Camp Bastion in Afghanistan. And we've also got, you can't see it behind the, the camera here, uh, some, rec some a recruiting poster <coughs> put out by the British Army in 2019 called Your Army Needs You. And it's a, it's a takeoff of the famous Kitchener poster with a pointing finger. And, but the figure is a, is a young man. And the, the slogan is uh, binge gamers. Your army needs you and your drive. So trying to get so-called millennial audiences to think about their, their gaming as, a, as embodying worthwhile military skills. Um, and then, of course, the red barrels pay off at the end with mm -hmm. game mode. Because as we all know, they blow up when you shoot them. Uh, and the other half of the exhibition was a, a playable game space. So, we couldn't have, so you can't actually play any of the games in the exhibition proper just because it's just not practical to put all these games up playably. So for the first three months of the run, we had a, a playable game space full of uh, original hardware, uh, consoles from the, 20, from the Atari 2600 in the 80s up to the Sony PlayStation, playing a uh, selection of games which I like. <laughs> <laughs> totally abused my position as curator to pick things that I, that I enjoyed from back in the day. Uh, there was GoldenEye on an N64 with four controllers, and there was a great deal of research was done. <laughs> Exhaustive, I should say. Uh, and that is that. So thank you. Uh, Nick and I will take questions. <laughs>